Jim Ishka. My job title is Assistant Conservator of Preparation and Photography in the Department of Conservation and Science, Photo Conservation. The department collects photographs. We have about 25,000 objects at the moment. I became interested in photography probably in, in middle school. I taught myself how to process film. Like many photographers, the, what really gets them hooked into the medium is when you first see that image come up in the developer. That's what hooked me. I am Pablo Garcia. I am associate professor in the Department of Contemporary Practices at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Photography obviously is one of the great disciplines that the School of the Art Institute has. For our first year students coming in, they probably have a specific idea about photography based on digital images that they're used to seeing. We try to also orient them a little bit into the history of the technology, a rich history that goes across a lot of different inventions, whether it's the history of optics that then leads to a chemical invention of photography that allows you to actually make an image fixed onto a surface, different imaging technologies, all the way up to the device that you hold in your pocket that happens to have a camera attached to it. Through the museum's collection, we can see this history of artists and scientists playing with optics. They experimented and created optical devices to learn about how we see and to create realistic images through drawing and photography. The principle of the camera obscura has been known since ancient times. Camera obscura means literally dark room in Latin, light passing through a small aperture or pinhole into a dark chamber will project an upside down reversed image of the scene outside. Artists started using camera obscuras probably in the mid 1500s when lenses became practical. Camera obscuras had been around for a long time and artists certainly would have seen them. Some artists would have seen them. And seeing the image produced by a camera obscura is quite remarkable and quite inspiring. The camera lucida was invented in 1807. So in the history of a lot of these optical technologies, fairly late, the camera obscura had been around for centuries. The camera lucida was uh, a simple device in which you had a prism on an adjustable stand. And when you looked down into that prism, you would see a, a ghosted image of the subject in front of you seemingly projected onto your paper. What this did was it allowed for a, a new way to teach drawing, a new way to draw realistically. So this would be a camera obscura. Look directly into there and you see, look down. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you see the lens. So our image is formed by light rays reflecting off of the flowers, coming into the lens. Uh, each point is reflecting light in many different directions. So why is the image upside down? So light bounces off of here and it bounces in every single direction, right? And some of that light is going to keep going. Until it, until it reaches the film plane. This is the bottom of our image, so it's gonna end up on the top, right, of our oh, plane. Wow. This is the top, it's gonna end up at the bottom. And every point in our image are all in a different, a different place, so the light coming off of them is all gonna end up at a different angle. So that's why it's upside down. So what you're gonna look at next is a, a camera lucida. So we've talked about a camera obscura. Uh, this is a camera lucida. The camera lucida was invented exclusively as a drawing tool. How many of you like to draw? <laughs> do you, why do you say you don't like to draw? I'm not very good. It is hard to draw. Like, it's, a, it's a something that's plagued people for centuries. When I'm looking at the drawing, I'm not looking at you. When I'm looking at you, I'm not looking at the drawing. If you can't see one or the other, you're, you're kind of moving a lot of information around. So in 1807, a Scottish chemist invented the camera lucida, and this is an example of one of the original ones. And you can see that unlike a big box with a lens, it is a small prism on an adjustable stand. When you look down inside to the prism, part of your vision goes straight to the page. Part of your vision goes out to the object. And so when you look down, it looks like 
an image of your subject on your page. Stand over it, and what you'll see is a partially ghosted image of the flowers, but also your pencil. So go ahead and give it a try. We'll just suddenly see it. Oh. There it is, there's the... Pretty accurate to the actual thing. Whoa, okay. <laughs> so what does it feel like? I'm just like tracing something, like putting your paper over like an iPad or something and tracing it. There was just an image on top of my paper and I was just like tracing it along. It was surprising, honestly. The magical trick in a way is not that the projection is actually onto a surface, but rather it's kind of in your eyeball. One of my areas of interest is how and why people draw. And what I have found and what research shows is a lot of people give up on drawing because every child picks up a crayon, everyone doodles, so that's drawing. And drawing is a wonderful, very universal act. A lot of people, when their skill doesn't meet their expectation, they give up. So my first thing is don't give up. The more you practice, the more you do any of the crafts and, and arts skills that you're interested in, the better you get. Let your expectation be inspiration for where you want to be. Artists have used techniques and tools and technologies for centuries to make their work better, uh, higher quality, to, to teach them and to develop their skills. Giving up is uh, not an option for someone who wants to work creatively. My advice to anyone who's interested in art, who wants to make a career out of it, should follow their passion and learn as much as they can about the art, learn the technical details, learn the scientific details of it, and just go for it and do something that you really, you really love.